Hello everyone, my name is Philip. I'm a filmmaker and today I'm going to be reviewing the Final Fantasy VII Remake. So, let's do it. We're gonna break it down with these categories over here. It's gonna be a very unique review. I'm gonna be lending my professional perspective because these are the categories we're covering right here. We're gonna start with narrative, cinematography, characterization, music, world building, performance, sound design, fight choreography, dialogue, pacing, adaptation, lighting and atmosphere, gameplay, creativity, design, visuals, and replay value. So it's gonna be an absolute blast, and I'm actually live on Twitch right now. So what we're gonna be doing is after every category, letting chat vote, and chat's gonna score it as what they want. It's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be an interactive review focused a lot more. It's that cinematic language that we love to dive deep into on this channel. Please make sure to subscribe if you wanna see more cinematic language analysis and you wanna hop into it, let me know in the comments or in the chat here on Twitch. We're gonna start, of course, with narrative. Now, this game, to me, shines. It is just so well crafted um, in every way. And one of the quickest ways you can sort of uh, detect this is in the structure of the story being rearranged to fit into uh, a, a multi-part saga as opposed to one game, as opposed to one story. We talked about it yesterday, treating it like a novel, treating it as a higher form of art. And just when you approach it from that stance, as they did with the original, it elevates the art piece to something more than a simple game. It elevates it into something that works with a perfect arc of all these characters, a narrative structure to it, as opposed to, you know, where gameplay is the main focus, the main structure. So I think it's just, it's so expertly done. You can just feel the love uh, pouring into it from the creators. We'll get into it with the other categories, but for me, narrative, because of these specific character arcs that appear, because of these uh, clean progressions that happen throughout the whole game, it's so well planned. Look at Cloud, look how he grows. It's fantastic. Um, so what we see right at the bat is just what we're looking at right now, the Sephiroth scene. Um, it's the inclusion of this villain as a mysterious figure brought in earlier, for example, to build this villain up, build up the relationship between Cloud and Sephiroth. And then by the end of the game, we're rewarded with this newly, uh, this new addition, this climax of Sephiroth, and such a clean narrative arc for all of the characters. Okay, in this case, even for Sephiroth. And then we see that he asks Cloud to join him. And then it has this Fellowship of the Ring ending, where it's this sort of like bittersweet, unfulfilled feeling. We're gonna chase down Sephiroth, chase down the Black Cape Man. Barrett is one of the characters who grows so much throughout this game, so much throughout this story. Cloud, you will see it on his face. And that of course comes down to performance, which we'll get to later. But you can see it, these characters grow um, from a narrative structure. It's so well crafted. And it's just so different than you'll get in most video games. That's why it's gonna score incredibly high here. So for me, Start on narrative. Narrative gets a 10 out of 10. Straight off, right off the bat, 10 out of 10. And we'll have chat vote in a second, of course, so get your, get your uh, numbers ready. But again, just to just to sum up, it's, it's so different than you'll get, and I was so pleasantly surprised. I had insanely high expectations for narrative in this game, and it blew my expectations out of the water. Uh, no ball was dropped for me in narrative whatsoever. So with that, we're gonna have chat vote. Let's take a look at the poll. What do you rate it? All right, the votes are the votes are pouring in as we speak. What does it look like, guys? What does it look like? What are we dealing with here? Looks like okay. Looks like we're getting a lot of tens, a lot of nines. Very good, very good. Gear with of Seven as a whole is one of the best stories ever told. It's very well done. Yeah, great. All right, so the 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 poll has concluded with the average being ten with thirteen votes and nine with ten votes. And we have one person gave it an eight. So I will say, this is the one thing that, uh, you can watch my full defense of the ending video if you want. I defend Namora, the director, and this as well. What I will say with this is, what the ending does is you have to think about a new viewer. So for me, uh, having played the game originally, it took me a second to be like, whoa, I didn't expect this. This is amazing though. You realize that when you see Sephiroth, when you see Zack at the end of the game, when you see Mr. Gongaga himself, you realize, for a new player, it's like, oh, who is this guy? Whoa, he has Cloud's sword. Where did Cloud get his sword? Okay, this is gonna be incredible. Like, we're gonna learn that eventually. Is this a flashback? Did that guy die? Like, why does Cloud have his sword? What's their relationship? 
Why is he fighting Shinra? I thought he, this guy looks like a soldier too. There's, so, there's all these awesome questions that get introduced. And a lot of people said, oh, it spoils everything. It didn't spoil anything. You just saw that one battle. So I think it's great. Um, a lot of people are saying a lot at once, which is... A lot of people said that about the Whispers. Like, oh, the Whispers is all at once. But I, I have to disagree, man. The Whispers are in it from almost the beginning of the game. Chapter 2. And from the point where... I mean, they're giving you hints throughout. With them, like, interrupting and saving Aerith. It's like, okay, they're trying to keep stuff as it should be. And then at the part with... Uh, with red, which is what, chapter 16, I think it is? Chapter 16? 17, possibly? No, I think it is 16. You uh, you learn from red what they are. It's like these whispers are uh, attempting to keep reality as it is, uh, you know, faith as it is. So it's not, like, it does introduce it quite a bit, and I think it's fine as, like, a, these mystery components from chapter 2 on, you learn a l slowly about them until the end when it's like, okay, that's what they are. They are fate itself. So... I don't know, I, I wouldn't say it's totally out of left field if they just appeared in the last scene and it's like, oh, by the way, this is fate and we're stopping. I would have been like, whoa, this is ridiculous. Get these guys out of here. But for me, I think it's great. I think it's positive and it's just a, a nice narrative component to uh, to get people excited for part two. And that includes me, that includes new viewers, and I did really like it. So for me, it's solid. Um, and like I said, there are a couple things that, um, of course, aren't perfect throughout, right? But for me, it's like the positives are so ridiculously high and that's going to be the same for a lot of these scores i will have some points that i think weren't perfect but it's just the good was so absurdly good that it just buries like the small amount of things i might, I might have done slightly different it just buries it from the sheer amount of uh of ambition of just passion that they have for this project and uh the art the artistic integrity that goes into it it's, it's mind-blowing so Anyways, let's move on. Crack1999, wow, thank you so much for the gift subs, Rabitzi. Absolute maniac. Thank you. Legend. To sell your friends on this game, to buy it and play it, this is the video. <laughs> this is the video. We're going to be going really deep into it. All right, guys, so moving on to cinematography. This game, I talked about it. I did a full shot-for-shot -shot breakdown of cinematic language that was used for the ending of this game. It is so incredibly done, guys, to the point where they are executing like perfect composition uh, as far as the Fibonacci numbers are concerned, the golden ratio. Like it is so perfectly done. It's so well done that this is stuff. This is a cinematic language that you do not see this level in video games. Uh, you'll see a very rudimentary understanding, uh, and sometimes like a lot of errors in editing in video games and shot selection. Shot selection. Uh, cinematography, uh, if I was the DP, it means director of photography is essentially cinematographer, if you guys don't know, on a, on a real film set. It would just be such a, a passion project. And the thing that blows my mind is they take the time, we'll get, we'll get more into this later, because uh, it's so tied to cinematography, they have a full lighting team for this game. And you can tell. Most games don't give a crap about lighting, and you can really tell. <laughs> it's quite bland, it's quite basic, they just kind of up the aperture, they up the ISO on the camera to just expose for whatever the, the character needs to be seen. They have a lighting team. They have three-point lighting. It makes sense, it looks great. That's why it has that Hollywood feel. To someone who's not even into that sort of thing, this filmmaking side, there's a subconscious understanding. It just feels more like a Hollywood piece. It feels more like a professionally done film, an epic film, uh, you know, a big action set like we're seeing here, Cloud versus Sephiroth. And it's just, there's mood. There's lensing choices that are so on point. Like I said in my, uh, we'll skip to this part for just a second to see. There's this scene here at the edge of creation. And the shot selection for this is so expertly done. I broke it down again. Check out this video on my, on my channel. I broke it down shot for shot. And the choices they made are so educated. It's incredibly done. It's perfection. But uh, as far as the lensing choices, they're doing what an actual cinematographer would do, an actual DP on set. Uh, to evoke emotions, to demonstrate feelings that uh, certain lenses are used for. It's not just what looks cool, and you get that with a lot of sort of like fledgling filmmakers, which is fine because video game creators are not filmmakers, right? Like, why would they be experts? But what, what we know about Square Enix is they've been making movies, films for a long time in all their games, man. Look at Final Fantasy from 7 on. Final Fantasy 8 really upped the, the cinematography, man. Final Fantasy 8 went bonkers with it. Final Fantasy IX was great as well. FF10, however, is when they started to go like, you know, 
they started to be on the sauce, man. They were on the sauce on FF10. Um, as far as, again, getting to the lensing, the deeper science of cinematic language. Um, how do you express certain feelings? What lenses do you use? They've been on that. So this scene right here says it all, man. It's, it's so incredibly done. It's so fantastic. Watch my full version. Long story short, cinematography, I can give nothing less than a 10. It's just, you do not see this in video games. We talk about Skyrim, which is like bottom of the barrel garbage when it comes to... I don't think there... Is there even cutscenes in Skyrim? I don't think so. But anyway, yeah, and again, if you guys haven't seen it, watch my breakdown. Um, it's very educational, too. I get I get very deep into the jargon of filmmaking, much more so than I am right now. Um, a lot of people were kind of intimidated by it, but you definitely come out knowing a lot more by the end of that video. So check it out. All right, guys, the poll has begun. What are we rating cinematography for this game? Cinematography, and we've got, you don't have to know all the science about it if you don't know. All you have to know is that essentially it's uh, the sophistication of the shot selection. Like, do you feel that it was up to, you know, like a film level? Do you feel it was up to like a real film's level? Do you feel it was, uh, you know, effective and expressing what it needed to in the emotions? Looks like we're getting some good votes here. We got a lot. We got three for nine. We got 19. Is that what that? 19 for 10. Secret Moogle in the background. Oh, what? No, you see nothing. You see nothing. There's nothing there because you guys aren't pure. I know you guys get really thirsty in the chat. Impure. 21 votes for 10 and four votes for nine. And there's just not a vote to be had below that. Yeah, not surprising at all. Moogle magic isn't perfect. Okay, okay, got you. It isn't perfect. <laughs> My name isn't Jesse Phil. <laughs> Good. Oh, Demi said, I'm giving it a nine, not because there's anything wrong, but because I feel the emphasis and focus on it is to the detriment of other components of the game. Oh, wow, interesting, Demi. Prefer the graphics of the in-game graphics versus the CG. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, which one do you prefer? Which which one do you guys prefer? The hair is more triangular and whatnot in the pre-rendered cutscenes because they don't have to mask it with like anti-aliasing and weird filters and stuff, right? So it's funny, I'm, I'm actually curious with like Unreal 5 how it's going to look because again, the hair is gonna look better. Will it look closer to the CG? These people who skip cutscenes and stuff seems insane to me, right, from my background, but a lot of people just don't care about it. So at the end of the day, um, a lot of people just want to play video games. They want to play like Fortnite. They don't care about cutscenes, right? So to say that that it's bad is is just factually wrong. The cinematography, it's, it's expertly done. Expertly done. We're moving on to the characterization. All right, characterization is so well done in this game. I really can't stand up about it, but we pull up this scene right here of Cloud. Uh, he, he, he thinks that killing Johnny is the right answer. And Tifa is genuinely scared, is genuinely upset by this. And it's just such a beautifully done scene. Um, and it expresses so much about the characters. And you have Tifa here who she's really scared. She realizes she doesn't know Cloud anymore. She says he's really changed. And Cloud is kind of struggling with, he's such a black and white person. He doesn't understand what it means to just murder some kid. He's like, oh yeah, but he, he was going to tell about Avalanche. It's like, yeah, but he's he's like a kid, dude. He's probably what, like 18? I don't know, Johnny? Like, hey, he's, he's a talker, but you're going to murder him without a question? You know, so it's this really hit me, this scene. Like the way she speaks, Tifa, there's such a care put into the characters. You see Cloud grow throughout the game. Cloud and Barrett you see them eventually speak to each other in a different way. When it opens, they're just trash talking each other nonstop, uh, yelling at each other, disrespecting at each other, insulting each other nonstop. And by the end, we have this poignant scene where Cloud, you know, he's not, he's not gonna give it up. He's not gonna actually be nice. But he says, when they say, you know, Cloud, are you gonna help us rebuild? And he says, kind of smirks and says, you know, for the right price. And that's his way of saying like, yeah, I, I got your back. Like, I'm, I'm with you guys. And that's huge for him. That's huge as a human being. Um, you have this scene where we have Barrett and Tifa. Let me skip through so it's not just fighting footage for this. Where's the scene where uh, we get Tifa's dress? Oh, here we go. Here we go! Barrett, after the, uh, of course, when the plate falls, it's a very disturbing and upsetting scene. In the course of this scene, so many things happen. We have Barrett who's mourning. He's a broken. And then we have Tifa, you know, Barrett's angry. He's upset. He wants to take action. He wants to destroy Shinra. Tifa takes it totally different. It's not just, we're sad. Wah, wah, we're sad. End of story. No, next scene. 
there upset. A Barrett is angry. He wants to lash out. He's, he's hurting himself. He's striking the stone. He thinks his daughter's dead. He thinks all of his friends have died. And then Tifa comes up to him and she's dead inside. She's completely dead inside. The, the way that uh, her name just gave me. Britt Barron delivers these lines. She says, this is our fault. We killed these people. They died because of us. And then Barrett switches because he's the leader. He says, I will take your burdens off your shoulders. He switches around and says, no, don't you ever say that. It's because of Shinra. No matter what happens, it comes back to Shinra. It's not on us. And then Cloud, because, you know, a lot of cheap anime tropes would be, oh, Cloud just rises to the occasion and runs over and hugs Tifa. And then, oh, they're, they're you know, they're good now. Everything's okay. He hugged Tifa because he stepped up as a man. He wouldn't know that. He wouldn't know that. He doesn't have those social skills. So he just stands there and he has no idea what he's doing, man. He's just standing there awkwardly. Like, doesn't even comfort Barrett or Tifa. He just kind of nods at Barrett, saying, like, yeah, I'm alive. <laughs> and then doesn't say a damn thing. But we notice, he notices, what does Barrett do to Tifa when she's just broken and dead inside? Barrett holds her, man. He embraces her to comfort her. And then later, in the garden scene with Tifa, what do we see? We see Cloud has grown. He has seen Barrett comfort a woman when she's upset. And he says, oh, yeah, that's right. I have to hug her right now. And it's like... He doesn't even know what to do. He's slowly raising his arms and then he hugs her. And it's just, it's so poignant for a million reasons, of course, um, for what's going on, what they're talking about. But it's just so beautiful. And you, again, you don't get that level of characterization in other games. You don't, you don't get that in some films. In most films, I'd wager, you don't get characterization like that. So I just use that as an example because it's so incredibly done. Um, it's, it's some of the subtlety, the subtlety that makes this so sophisticated. Um, as we're staring at Tifa's abs here. But yeah, so it's just, you don't get it in most films, you don't get it in most games by a long shot. Again, talk about Skyrim, right? It's just, I took an arrow to the knee. You don't usually get that level, so. Um, I mean, it's just off the walls. I can think of a million other examples, but that to me is sort of the ultimate uh, characterization. I, I, I can't do it. I can't get anything less than 10. Because what other game is on this level? I would ask you. Like we have when we when we give these ratings, we have to benchmark it against other games. Games don't do this. It's like it's not even in the same category. So I have to give it a ten, right? Like who else does this? <laughs> yes, her abs. <laughs> it's just funny. Like, the subtlety of characters. I lost my train of thought. Tifa's abs. Okay, so we're gonna turn it over to chat, and chat's gonna vote. One little thing. We haven't even, we haven't even mentioned Aerith, as you know, I'm a very Tifa heavy person. So, anyways. All right, the poll has begun. We turned it over to chat. Let's see these votes. All right, so what do we got? What do we got? Characterization. We're looking at uh, one vote for nine, 24 votes for 10. I gave one example. There's so much growth in this game, and they they give such a care, such a care to everyone, and you, you don't see it in most films, for God's sake. You just don't see it. Uh, and it's cool because they take advantage. They're using the strengths of this format, guys. The strengths of video games is it's a long story. You can take time and really ruminate with these characters so it feels more like a novel, right? Where you can have the most sophisticated characterization in a novel because there's so much space. We can get internal monologue, we can do things. We can use the tools to our advantage. So they do it similarly with this game. They use it to their advantage and it's just beautiful. It's beautiful to behold. I need higher than, oh, we're gonna move on to music in a second. Yeah, you just wait. Uh, Demi says 10 out of 10 for characterization for me. Characters are far and away the best part of the game. I agree. It's just, we're looking at something which is such a great story and the fact that the characters stand out this much in this great plot. Do you know what I mean? Says everything. You guys know what's next and it's gonna be hype. We're moving on to music, which, who we're moving on to music. It is just, it is no freaking joke, man. Thank you so much for the follows, guys. Welcome to the Philosophers. I agree, Judge. Yeah, Namora's favorite character is Barrett, and you just, you know. I mean, this scene right here with, with Cloud and Tifa, we have this relationship with them where it's, it's, it's awkward. They haven't seen each other in five years, even though they, they have this connection of childhood, right? That's incredibly close connection. It's different, man. They haven't seen each other. She doesn't know him anymore. The run-in with Johnny really freaks her out. Like, uh, and he has feelings for her, even if it is, you know, a childhood romantic connection. And then there's this scene where he he's holding the cup. This, this even blends with cinematography. But right here, he's holding the cup. And she says, how is it? And he's looking at the cup. But then we see from his point of view, his field of view, and the depth of field is focused on Tifa, as he says, beautiful. And then she gets all embarrassed and goes away. It's just so nicely done. These little character moments that 
They didn't even have to do it. They didn't even have to do it, guys. And that's why, to me, it, it takes the cake for characterization. It's, it's the subtlety. There it is. See? And he, she knows he's talking about her. It's just, it's great. We can gush about it all day. Cosmo Canyon, same color as her eyes. Ooh, that's a good point. All right, guys. So we're talking about the music. Where to begin even on this? The music is so incredible in this game and it's so expertly crafted. Um, some of the best ways I can talk about it is, I mean, we can talk about variety. We can talk about different genre of music, but they still maintain a signature sound throughout the entire soundtrack, a signature feeling. Even though there's different artists arranging several different tracks, uh, there's different songs, because we have Nobu's work, of the original, of course, as just the backbone, the skeleton of all this. But, but then, we have all of these other works from Suzuki, from Hamauzu, from Shota, this guy who came from, I think, Ace Combat, and he just brings this fire, man, this, this Hollywood cinematic energy, and it's amazing, it has this filmic quality. I mean, they talked about it in the behind the scenes, they brought a choreography to the soundtrack. Every scene works perfectly. It's not just, yeah, whatever, throw, throw a track on it. It is, it is choreographed to the beat. It's a dance of music. It's so well done. This review format is amazing. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Where there's, there's a fullness to it that it just, what's the word I'm looking for? It, uh, it persists. The feeling persists. Man, you have songs like, and we'll move through the soundtrack a little bit. So you have songs here like Bombing Mission, which is, it just has a fire to it. Has a raging fire to it. Has that cinematic flair, but it has that old school Nobu feeling from the original game, and it's just oh, it's it's so well realized. If that makes any sense, it's so completely realized, and it's choreographed to the scenes. Even though it's the full version, they do like cutaway different versions of it for the cutscenes. It's just so well done, so well done. And then okay, one of the highlights of the soundtrack, an example of the cinematic sophistication, is we have this "Let the Battles Begin." just evolution that takes place throughout the entire soundtrack starting with this like hints in the let the battles begin uh, in the mako reactor in this version and then it comes it, it persists throughout the entire soundtrack but they slowly evolve it and in this one let the battles begin which plays in chapter two it's like a seven or eight minute version of it on the soundtrack that slowly builds and they won't give us the bridge that happens at the end they slowly build to it, they slowly build to it, they tease us, and then just at the end of chapter two in the final battle, we get this song, and it's just, it's glorious. It's so beautifully done. And that's an example of just the, they looked at it and said, okay, we have to play this a lot in this game. How do we do it? Let's bring back the nostalgia by hinting at it and dangling it in front of them and kind of like giving them just a little bit over and over again to the point where it just explodes and you feel it. And you feel the energy, and I'll play the song that they, that they tease. So, as you can tell, it's this sort of uh, build-up version. And then here... Finally, you hear it? Finally! You get this part of the song, and it's just... When you hear it, you just erupt into a victorious fanfare, man. Just like the game. And it's, it's just so expertly done. I, I can't even talk enough about it. So that's just that one song, guys. They've also brought in works from Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. Uh, like the Promised Land, which is a fantastic choral piece that Nobu did back in the day. This is a strings version of it. Incredibly done. Uh, we have Eret's theme uh, and Tifa's theme working really well, like carrying their weight throughout the whole soundtrack. And it's just, it's beautifully done. They really use them in fantastic ways. We have like a battle version theme of Tifa's theme, which sadly didn't make the cut for the soundtrack. We had a morning Tifa's theme, also didn't make the soundtrack after the plate fell. We have, uh, we have this uh, example here. Smash them, rip them. It's just this ridiculously upbeat version of Tifa's theme. Uh, it actually has the prelude in the background uh, during Tifa's theme. It's just so beautifully done. So that's just another example of the character themes. Uh, we have the all the scenes in the garden, which use all the main character motifs. Of course, Nobu Amatsu, known for his light motifs, which is uh, pretty much a cinematic term, uh, an operatic term rather, where you would use certain themes for different characters or ideas. Uh, throughout, a, throughout an opera. And of course, it's most well known from Star Wars. You have the Imperial March, which is Darth Vader's theme. You have uh, the Force theme, which plays, you know, whenever there's some, some rousing moment, uh, or some, some Jedi, you know, coming of age, you know, the, the list goes on. Uh, Princess Leia's theme. And it's just, it's so expertly done. Again, you do not get this level of music in games. 
Shinra's theme is another highlight that really persists throughout the entire soundtrack. You know Shinra's theme, whether you're fighting the Turks, whether it's Rufus. Uh, here's the original Shinra's theme, uh, which brings back that feeling from the original perfectly. Where the Legend of Cherith started, exactly. Legend of Cherith. Uh, it brings back that feeling perfectly. Those Chosen by the Planet, Sephiroth's theme, another standout. It persists throughout the entire soundtrack. So well done. Another example we have, so when you look at Shinra theme, you have just not even counting the various cutscenes which cover it and, and bring it back, uh, those ideas. You have the Turks theme. Like even this, you know, the Reno theme, if you listen, has Shinra theme coming throughout it. Just so well done. It's very exciting. Uh, you have, and then sort of the final iteration of it, one of the final iterations of it is Rufus's battle theme, which is a reprise of Shinra theme with the boss battle theme, those who fight further, right here. And it's just, it is such a good song. Um, I was listening to it earlier when I was working out. The sauce works in mysterious ways. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's just, these themes, uh, they exist throughout the whole piece, or throughout the whole piece of the game, this, this art piece. And it's so well realized. You don't get it in most games. There'll be a couple cool themes, but the level of exploration of musicality, which you usually don't get, um, just for the sake of art, you can feel the passion coming off of these guys when they work on uh, when they work on the soundtrack. It's incredibly done. Can't say enough about it. So with that, let's just look at for for uh, the sake of this video the other side of the soundtrack, which is of course the new pieces. We have like infinite joyous beautiful pieces like Infinity's End which are just pfft, incredible incredible you know when this uh, this part right here I was loving it. I was like, this is great but when the Hamazu trumpet hits you just you know it's him if you heard the Unlimited Saga soundtrack it's just such a signature style right here oh what does it what does that do to you it, it, it you ascend to the heavens. This is a totally new piece. It doesn't reference any musical ideas from Nobu. Incredibly done. And then we have to address, of course, Suzuki, which takes care of these these amazing themes, uh, like uh, this, like Funk With Me, which is a piece that plays during Cloud's uh, escapades in Wall Market. Incredible little piece of music that goes to a choreographed dance uh, that happened before. Sounds like an FF10 track. Yeah, for sure. FF10, FF13, because Samazu worked on them. Dancing songs are amazing, yep. The dance routine is fantastic, yeah. And it, th this this plays into some of the other categories that we're gonna get into, but again, the dance routine in itself is just a ridiculous production that must have taken a huge budget just to do it. So, you know, we'll talk more about that later when we get to creativity in some other sections, but performance, but it's out of this world. It really is, so yeah, that's just, you know, we could talk about this all day. I will be doing a separate video on the soundtrack, like really analyzing it and diving deep into it, so get ready for that. But, you know, as we stand, I think we've talked enough about the, the sort of variety. It's to the point where there's 156 songs on the soundtrack and we're missing at least, like, probably 20 songs or more from the game that we all, uh, that they didn't make the cut. And then there's all of the, uh, there's all of the, the jukebox songs, which are another 35 songs, I believe, or 33 or something like that, that we just don't get. We just don't get them. And of course, oh, you guys are going to have a heart attack if I don't play Do Recompense, I know. So we'll put on Do Recompense, just for a second. Of taking Nobu's work and just putting it on the sauce, man. Like, out of control. But it's cool that these works can exist because the environment's really fun. You're fighting these crooks, these criminals in the back alleys and stuff. But it retains that feel of the original uh, oppressed people. And it's great. They're on the physical OST, awesome. 20 gap, put on the special edition. Wait, are you serious, ID buddy? No. So are you saying like the, autocorrect loves to wreck me? Reload many times because I ended up bumping into it. Oh, the jukebox. Okay, I thought you were talking about the song. Like the jukebox songs are cool, but I want the songs from the, the soundtrack that didn't make it. Uh, my favorite one is the the song that plays before you go fight the whispers when you see Zack the first time and stuff. It is, I think, one of my favorite pieces in all of Final Fantasy. It's like a, at least a 10 minute song. I don't even know how long it is. 
It's got those chosen by the planet. It's got Aerith's theme. It's got the opening theme. It's got Shinra theme. It's got the main theme of Final Fantasy. Like, it's crazy. That's an example of the, cinem uh, the cinematic language of music that they use. And it's not on the soundtrack. <laughs> it's choreographed to like every person that's on screen, their theme plays. But anyway. It had hip hop de chocobo. Uh, anyway, so yeah, that's 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 my talk on the music. We're gonna do a full video on it, so I'll stop myself there because I just I need to like I need help. I'm gonna talk about it forever. So okay. We'll stop there. Do recompense is, is hyping you guys up and we're gonna move on. But for me, like okay, I will say there's one thing about the music, I will say, that uh, does detract it for me. Now I know don't everybody relax. Everybody relax, I'm gonna explain it. So the only thing about the music is, and I think you'll agree with me on some level, is if you notice in the original, I mentioned the the idea of light motif, which Nobu uses, right? So in the in the original, that persists so strongly into your memory and the nostalgia because there's only one version of each song, but secondarily, there's just less new ideas introduced. It's just so ingrained into your memory. Like whenever Shinra is on the screen, it plays Shinra's theme. The one version of Shinra's theme. You do, I think for new players, I think no one's gonna argue with me on this, they will not be able to just tell you, like without a doubt, like, oh, this, this is Shinra's theme, right? Like, I think it's it's not as obvious, it's not as beaten into your brain. So it's weird because it's because the music's more sophisticated, there's like 50 versions of Shinra's theme, but um, at the same time, you lose a little bit of that. Lack of sophistication makes the songs more memorable, but it's definitely not an actual point off because it's way too abstract an idea. And I think you guys know what I mean though. So anyways, I mean, do we even have to worry about it anymore? Music gets a 10. <laughs> Absolutely. There's no question. Um, this already has gone down as one of the greatest soundtracks ever composed in games. Um, and in general. I think no one's arguing that. Literally, they're a concert series of only Final Fantasy VII music at this point. Not even Distant Worlds. So, um, my point is with that... They've taken this and they've elevated it even more, and it's absolutely ridiculous um, what they were able to achieve. You can see the passion pouring off of every composition that exists. And with that, we're going to turn it over to chat and have chat vote on music. What are you guys going to score it? If you're here and you're just joining, get ready to vote. The poll is going to be up in one second. Here we go. We're looking at 27 for 10 so far. Holy mama, you guys are one wean angel. All right, we got we to gotta mention it. We got to mention it before I end music, so let's just... Let's just do it. You guys are going to get excited, I know. What happens here in One Wing Angel is you guys know how Nobu Uematsu composed it, right? So, Nobu composed a bunch of different puzzle pieces of, uh, of essentially like ideas, musical ideas uh, for a melody. And then he deconstructed it and moved them around in, a, in the order that he saw fit that was best. Okay? What they did in this game is they unpacked it. They did the opposite because it's not the last Sephiroth battle. They said, okay, how are we gonna use Sephiroth's theme but not spoil the full version? We're gonna move the parts around again. It's so genius. So they move the parts around again. I'll talk more about it in the music video. It's incredibly dumb. It All right, so world building, guys. Um, this game does a fantastic job on world building. It's, it's hard to even express, but what we're looking at right now is perfect because it's cloud running through the slums. This game takes it to almost like a novel, like almost a Brandon Sanderson novel uh, level with the world building. It takes it to a place of such detail. So there's, there's such a richness to the environments. There's such a joy that is put into bringing every single character to life. Uh, every single person comes live in such a uh, in such an enjoyable such a fulfilling way like, look we have wedge with his cats right when I first got to the slums one thing stood out to me I was running down up, up and down the streets I didn't even hear probably half not even half of what was being said by all these characters and when it came down to it we're looking at people at like food carts it reminded me of New York City and they're just like oh we got to come down here to try this one dish it's so good it's so beautiful somebody just said in chat spectra it's so alive and there's not a better word to use for it. It's incredibly alive. It's just, it's so rich down to the random people on the street. There's the line, of course, somebody's talking about like, how do we blend, uh, how do we choose a color for our clothes in the slums that blends in with dirt? 
because it is, you know, we can't really clean our clothes. The water is rotten and smells like rotten eggs and sulfur. And like even that line, the way Tifa says it, so like, oh yeah, it almost gets rid of the rotten egg smell. It's very poignant for me because my water where I am right now smells like rotten eggs. So it's just, uh, it's sulfur. It, it, sulfur gives that smell. So it's just like, man, it brings it to life. It brings that sort of, uh, that bit of tragedy to the slums, that bit of realism to it. Uh, of course, we have Jesse on screen right now, who is just such an alive character. But they go that extra mile to explain, oh, Jesse's in a house with a bunch of other actresses who are, you know, trying to make it big. Those little touches. Oh, yeah, her dad, by the way, got into a mako poisoning accident because he felt he was overworked and uh, collapsed on the job. Like, real stuff that would happen. We don't get that in the original FF7. We don't get that in most games. That's for damn sure. This love of world building. Like, when people think about world building, they usually picture, like, Shinra freaking tower, man. Shinra building is another example. Like, you have the workers in there. They show us an accountant in Shinra tower who's just going about their day. And it's so easy in the, the original because it's so black and white in that way to just be like, oh, yeah, Shinra's, like, evil, evil, evil corporation. You forget that there's a bunch of people who work there just trying to pay their bills and take care of their family that don't... Uh, know that Shinra is an evil propaganda pumping like war machine you know they're just they're just working there as an accountant or something like they have no idea what's going on behind the scenes they don't know that Heidegger is evil and you know President Shinra is like has all these secret plans with Wutai and stuff so they take that time man to make you realize that it's a it's a lot deeper than that it's a lot deeper than just like oh um bad guy mean and end of story right so that's that's world building for me um every freaking time an event happens Every single NPC gets a new line in the slum, guy, or a new like two or three lines. I have never seen a game like this. Like I know, like Mass Effect and everything has rivaled it with world building for sure. Um, my, I used to watch my, I've never played it, but I used to watch my brother play. He'd be on like I think it was called the Citadel, running around and talking to people, and they all had cool things to say. It really gave like life to that universe to that world. And this game is just, it's the same thing. It's so alive. Um, but what I notice is it's more intimate in this game, and it really works to its advantage because there's uh, there's less to cover, they can just really lean into it, and that's why the multi-part multi saga is a better choice, because Midgar is truly alive on this because it's the only focus. I'm trying, but I can't think of anything that's wrong. Like, I had something wrong with the music, and I still gave it a 10 because it was way too good. So world building, I'm gonna give it a 10, man. Absolutely. I see no reason not to. And with that, we're gonna turn it over to chat. And it is, of course, the orphanage, man. The the leaf house. Looking at Biggs, man, they take that time. If you do talk to those people, to turn it around and say, oh yeah, uh, Biggs actually was an orphan. And then he grew up there and became a teacher and now still goes back and helps out at the orphanage. And then you see those kids, you see them, you see their classroom, you see how bad it is in the slums, man. It's tragic, it's sad. Um, it's just, it's all so well realized. So that's why it's a 10 for me. Awesome. All right. So it did win with 10, but we had actually, I think, probably the highest count for nine in this one with nine. So let's hear in the chat. What do you guys thought? What's uh, what's the reasons for those eights and nines? I'm only going to nine due to stubbornness. I wish I could have explored more slums or the upper plate, but because of the narrative, I understood why I couldn't. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't say that necessarily uh, exploring everything is world building. That would be more in like an exploration category, but I, I see what you're saying. You want to see it all. You want freedom. What's her name? What's her name? Uh, Miss Miss Folia, who teaches at the uh, who teaches at the orphanage, is actually dreams of becoming a like exotic dancer at the Honey Bee Inn. Yeah, I mean, look, look at Don Corneo's mansion, man. Look at look at Wall Market. When you talk about world building, just look at Wall Market, man. It's 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 this hive of scum and villainy, but it's still Midgar. It's still dirty. It's still a slum. But there's, of course, the people with the opulence, uh, Don Corneo and his mansion, hiding away. And it's just... So we moved on now, guys, to performance. All right, so for me, performance is incredible in this game. It's so well done. Um, it stands out. We talked about it a lot. They've, they have ascended from being sort of like anime, anime tropey voices and stuff like that. They've ascended to such a high level of delivery. Th this scene is perfect to have on right now. Just Tifa and Cloud in the room. These are the scenes where the performance shines for me. Britt Baron and Cody. I can't remember his last name. What is his last name? Somebody tell me in chat. Uh, incredible delivery. It's so human. It's so real. And it's not, you know, 
hey Cloud, what are we doing today? Like, it's not this sort of like cartoony anime delivery. There's such a depth to the voices. There's such a subtlety. And that's not even mentioning the facial motion capture, which is the first time, Cody Christian, right? It's the first time they used a uh, full mocap facial capture for these characters and delivered so well on it. And it's just, it's, it's a beauty to behold. Uh, even this scene, which is very like horror-esque, uh, you can see the fear. Oh, this isn't the scene I was thinking of. When when Cloud sees the 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 remnant, the the guy who's going to be a member of the reunion, uh, Marco, you can see the fear in Cloud's face, and the way that Cody performs that scene is genius, man. Like it's it's terrifying. It's not like you would hear in anime. It's it's just it's terrified. Like he sounds genuinely upset, like and unwell, and it's just very well done. Even the children are done amazingly. Yes, children are played by children. Marlene is a standout in this game. Because she was actually played by a child, and you can tell, man. It sounds like something like Disney would do, like a Disney-level performance. So well done. So well done. So yeah, it's, it's incredibly done. The Japanese, of course, is still, um, as far as I understand, it's the same voice as Advent Children, right? So it's still just like very anime voicey, which is why I uh, would recommend the English full stop, because they got, you know, television actors, like... Uh, camera actors, which what you get with camera acting instead of voice acting in stage is you get uh, a lot more quiet performances, a lot more subtlety in the voices because the camera's right in your face, you don't have to yell, you don't have to be big. When you're on stage, when you're doing voice acting, you have to exaggerate a little bit because there is no facial, uh, well in voice acting there is no facial performance. So you really have to put it all into your voice. Um, but these characters in the facial mocap, they can, you can get a lot across and it's beautiful. Brianna White is incredible as well. She really kills it. Yeah, oh my god, can we even talk about John Eric Bentley? <laughs> he is ridiculous. Uh, John Eric Bentley really, really, really like kills it in this game. He's so incredible. He has such a subtlety to him because you think in the beginning he's just like, you know, more smooth, more uh, intense. And then you see him, he gets really angry. It's like, oh, can we even trust this cloud dude? He gets really upset, ex-soldier. And then later we see him with his daughter. And he has another layer to him of like this sweet teddy bear that you didn't expect and this caring man, this caring gentleman who just wants to protect his daughter. And it's just, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper every time. And man, by the end of the game, you get that line with Barrett where he says, and let's not even talk about the plate collapse scene where John Eric Bentley like broke all of our hearts. Incredible performance in that. Incredible. Uh, Brianna did incredible for her first video gig. Of course. Yeah, she killed it. She did incredible even besides that. Yeah. Amazing performance. But yeah, there's a scene with uh, Barrett and Cloud before they go up on the wall, and he says, you know, when I first met you, I thought you were the worst person I've ever met. But then, you know, you grew on me. I get you now. I know it's all fake. And it's such a good line. Let's say it. There's so much in it, man, performance. And that's not even to mention, uh, mention the motion capture for the choreography, for just the movement and everything. It's so completely well done. Uh, and again, it, it avoids that, that heightened... Uh, stilted way of speaking. It's still there a little bit. It's still there a little bit with certain characters that are like, you know, anime voice, act voice actors. But man, with that main cast, it's just, I can't possibly detract from it. I mean, look at Advent Children. Direction. It's not bad. It's just a different way of directing. Let's, let's clarify. It's not bad. You speak in an anime way. It's just a different way of directing. This is a little more believable, a little more realistic, uh, a little more organic. And then look at this compared to Advent Children, right? It's just night and day difference. So how can we possibly detract from it? I'm trying to think of a bad performance, honestly. Um, I can't. Like I said, I can't. Like if, if there's like one NPC who sounds like, you know, not as good as the main characters, that, that, that can't give me a nine for performance. You know, like the main characters are the focus of the story. So for me, it's a ten. I can't. I can't detract from it. There's not. There's not any glaring issues that I can think of. The trio, yeah, dude, the trio in Wall Market was great. Oh, Red, oh, Red is that. Uh, everybody's great. Sephiroth, fantastic. So good. There's a depth to Sephiroth. And then when you hear him in the uh, in the drum, when you see him, like, going to Genova in the flashback, like, he sounds unhinged. He sounds crazy. So he's not, like, new, you know, kind of, like, smooth talker Sephiroth. That's when he was, like, losing it. And you can hear that in him. Really good performance. Hojo. Heidegger, exactly. Yeah, Heidegger's fantastic. It's Waka from FF10. Would you even know? No way. Um, President Shinra. Rufus. Dude, Rufus, I'm sorry, is a standout performance for me. Rufus, man. Oh, my God. 
He's so detached and, and almost inhuman in the delivery and uncaring. It's really impressive to me. That whole just like, no. I own you. You're a soldier. Ooh, gives me chills, man. So well done for Rufus. I cannot wait for the future Rufus stuff. Wedge. Oh, God. Wedge is so good. Wedge is so good in English. Yeah. Brit. Oh, my God. Yeah. Brianna White. Fantastic. Like, this is so many standout performances. So, yeah, it's absolutely a 10 for me. Absolutely. Hope they keep this horse laugh. Yep. I hope they do, too. All right. Let's hand it over to Chad. If you're just joining, we're going to do a poll. Let's see what you guys think. All right. This is for performance. Get ready to move. CC Zach posting his more posted. I actually really like Zach. I really like Zach in this game. I know a lot of people didn't, but like it's so earnest and it's so like Zach is a dork, dude. He's a serious dork. Let's do squads and like yeah, like it, it was great. I loved it. Hey Cloud, did you see that? Like he would say something like that. I almost died fighting an army. Like hey, hey man, did you see that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> like that's so Zach to me. Very earnest. Like he's he's kind of like Wedge actually. I picture Zach is a wedge who isn't who isn't uh, doesn't have self doubt issues. He doesn't wish he did more. Like he, they have that same feel. Yeah. Listen. The only reason. Yeah. The only reason the Zach feels off is because you were expecting to hear uh, what's his name, uh, Rick. Rick Gomez. The freedom lines were kind of off. Really? I liked it, man. I actually really liked it. Um, the music was great there too, though. It's like I want that on the soundtrack, but it didn't make it. Sound design. The reason I chose the Mako reactor for uh, sound design. Is that it's just it's so it's this idea of making the music and the sound design blend in so you, you can hear the, the just that sound you can hear the sound of the planet being sucked dry and it's just like oh, it's so incredibly done honestly so incredibly done and then the mock corrector itself has this like whine to it um, in the opening there's an opening shot of this girl looking at the mock corrector it's a young girl in the playground and she looks up and you hear the Mako reactor turn on. It's actually on the soundtrack. The sound made it to the soundtrack. And it's just like this horrifying, foreboding sound. Like this whine. It's like the, you can hear the cry of the planet type thing. And it's just, it's so genius, man. But I mean, we're looking at, I talked about it at some point. It's, it's such a satisfying sound design. Like when you pop a potion, for example, it has this like, ooh, this satisfying like dopamine release to it that makes you really feel like refreshed as if you're cloud, you know? So that's genius as well. Um, there's so many more examples of like the fighting sounds are so on point. Somebody did a silent video where they fought Sephiroth with no music on. And guys, the level of sound and like Foley and everything, performances that are in there, it, it goes back to performance, honestly, for that stuff. Incredible professionally done. It's unique, it's great, it does what good sound design does in film and in storytelling, which is it establishes what's happening, so like you know what's happening, so there's no confusion, but then it also like lends more info. It does more besides just like the the facts of what's on screen. And when it does that, it starts adding into world building, like I said with the Mako reactor. It starts adding into the intensity of like certain fights and everything. If it's unique sound, and that's again great sound design, it is a unique sound for Cloud Sword. Is a unique sound when Sephiroth swings. Um, there was no point where I was like, "Ugh, God, that sound's been reused 20 times. Get it out of here." Um, there's a variety to the sound design. It's not just like, "Oh yeah, that's the blank sound," and it got boring. So when you do stuff like again, like the potion popping sound, it's got to be really well designed so it doesn't get old. You're gonna hear it a lot. Um, so yeah, to me, this is a great, a great category. It's fantastically done. So for me, it's a 10, easy 10. If you guys can think of anything else to add, please. Um, please do. I'm gonna turn it over to chat. Let's get this poll going. Yeah, I think I heard in one of the trailers or something, Barrett in Japanese, it was like, ugh, it was cringe, man. And I heard a lot of people, and this this is the sort of false equivalency that people have, is they don't understand that Japanese anime voice acting is really bad acting. Like, really over the top. Um, the bikes, I mean, got ugh, the sheer amount of work, guys. It's, even, it's hard to explain, even from an editing standpoint, guys. Like, from a film editing standpoint, the amount of sound effects that are in this game, guys, it's mind blowing. Um, that's why it has to get a ton for me. Like I, I can't even picture the amount of just like workhorse power that went into making the sound design for this game. It's insane, guys. So fight choreography. Many of you know um, that I actually am also a martial artist and I choreograph a lot of stuff for both my fun collabs with other YouTubers and 
But this game, guys, it's next level. It's in the fight car. And when I say fight choreography, it's not just in the cutscenes, mind you. It's like the movements of the characters in battle. And it shines, man. The fight choreography is out of control. It is so brilliantly done. And I'm not trying to get in like too many martial arts terms here or anything, but again, it's sort of similar to sound design in that there's a there's a signature style of all the characters that's so well fleshed out and so different and so fulfilling to witness. And when you see it all come together, it's just it's so satisfying. Like Tifa's combos. Can we talk about the fight choreography and Tifa's combos? It's a mixture of like Shaolin Gong Fu and like Tai Chi and all this other stuff that's like created for the game and unique movement and when we talk about the choreography even the dance sequence which is probably should have gone out of performance out of control man the amount of work and then of course we have to mention the ending uh the ending duel with Sephiroth and Cloud uh, on the edge of creation is so incredibly done and when I say fight choreography I'm not just talking about the movements of the motion capture no 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 Good fire choreography for film has to function on film, which means it has to make sense with camera movement. So this is where all this starts to come together. Cinematography. When you're doing fight choreography and you swing from this side, you can't have the camera over there. Or you don't see it correctly. And it's bad choreography, so you have to choreograph for the camera. And it's literally all coming together at that point of like a... I can't say Hollywood, because Hollywood usually has like... <clears throat> very subpar choreography <laughs> compared to Hong Kong, but we'll say like a Hong Kong level choreography or a really good movie um, choreography. Like there are some good in Hollywood, but they're rare, unfortunately. Gravity defying motorbike scenes with Roche annoys me. Really, Gunblade? Yeah, actually, I've seen a couple people that annoyed, but um, you gotta remember that Cloud is like superhuman. Cloud and Roche are soldiers. They can actually do that stuff, and it's not. It's not out of the question when you have Genova cells to do that stuff. Like, uh, the motorcycle thing is definitely pretty crazy, but look at how Cloud fights. He swings around like a sword that looks like it's, you know, 50 to 100 pounds. Like it's a toy. Getting chills again, you know it, putty. Hollywood fight choreography equals shaky cam. Yep, shaky cam, cut all the time. Have to cut on every single hit because we can't sell it at all. And uh, <laughs> switch angles to confuse the audience. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. So anyway, that's uh, that's just some of the instances. But again, it's more about just it's it's more than just cool movements. It has to make sense for the camera. It has to you're almost acting for the camera. And there's just a velocity. They do a great job of again. What did I say earlier? Using the tools, uh, the advantages of the tools that you possess. So what they're able to do is combine. I'm assuming. I don't confirm this a ton of motion cap work with like Cloud's way of fighting with you know stuff that is inhuman that you cannot possibly do like when Cloud is you know jumping really far when he's doing the motorcycle fight nobody motion captured that obviously right so it's impossible so they're able to uh, to blend it's this genius amount where you know he'll jump and it, it looks like a human jump but then he'll go further and, he'll, and it looks like oh my god he's flying almost then he lands cleanly and uh, in a believable way, he's human again. And that's the difference you usually won't get in most like kind of cartoony superhero stuff. Like when you look at, for example, uh, um, you guys know I don't like superheroes, but like a lot of the Marvel stuff, it, you're pretty much watching a cartoon at that point. Because it's just like 99% of the frame is CG. Like they might as well just make like a Final Fantasy game, right? And it, you can tell sometimes when it's like, oh, God, that, that was not real. So like obviously this isn't real. It's animated, right? So they have the advantage of not having to... Uh, you're, you're already suspending your disbelief that extra mile. So it's not so ridiculous uh, to say, oh, Cloud can jump 20 feet and it, it looks okay if it's not perfect human movement. So that does work to the advantage well, as well. But the ending duel with Sephiroth, man, watch my breakdown of the, uh, of the ending shot for shot as well. I get more into the fight choreography of that specific scene. But my goodness, is it just out of control yes this song makes you feel like a soldier first class absolutely a bike choreography in this game <laughs> it's that level of uh, impressive so yeah for me it, it's, it's fantastic man and I I make fight scenes for God's sake you know I, I study martial arts I lived as a Shaolin warrior monk in China uh, I love this stuff I live for this stuff I think about it all day I imagine it and to get this level of sauce 
in it to uh, to enjoy is not something that I expected ever. So very, very cool. And uh, I can give it no less than a perfect score. Again, I had to compare it to other games. There's only a couple games that I can even mention have this great level of movement, but they don't have it in the cutscenes, guys. Like, I, I instantly think of Nier, right? Nier Automata has insanely good choreography in, in the fights, in the combos that you can do as 2B. But, but, I don't recall any fight scenes where there's like epic duels that are so well realized. There's like a couple swings here and there and stuff, you know? There's no like set pieces. And in this game, we have actual choreographed set pieces. Look at the Reno duel with Cloud. Uh, in the church. Incredible choreography. And we have to talk about the, the cake here, which is, of course, Rufus. The Rufus fight. Choreography is out of control, man. It's so well done. I can't, I can't say enough about it again. It's, just, it's so incredibly done. Uh, Rufus, the way he throws the coins and shoots them and separates his gun, it's so Final Fantasy. It's so big and ridiculous and out of this world, but... It makes sense within this universe, and it's just so satisfying. Guys, he shoots with the gun. He throws the coins up again. There's actual fight IQ in this game. We have characters using fighting strategies to confuse each other within the choreography. Do you realize how ridiculous this is? This is why he gets a 10. Literally, Rufus throws it up once and then shoots the coin. So then Cloud's looking at the coin the second time, and then Rufus uses his shotgun to propel his body towards Cloud to get an opening on him. It's, it's just so well done. Like, there's a fight IQ. Um, I only discovered it when I analyzed it frame by frame in my ending breakdown. Watch that video. But Cloud actually tries to fake out Sephiroth at the end. He goes, Ugh, and then switches last second, and then Sephiroth barely turns. Like, guys, it's incredibly done. There's fight IQ between the characters. You don't see stuff like that. Yakuza has incredible fight choreography. I agree. Incredible. We'll talk about it sometime. The gun katas were strong. Yes. The gun food. John Wick would be very proud of Rufus. He's studied under John Wick. <coughs> yeah, the Dark Star co-op. Like, guys, there's a choreography in the cutscenes, but also in the battles. Look at right now. We're seeing Tifa just, like, wreck people. I love the sword switch from Cloud in the end. And yes, this is what you say. Yes, Aaron. All right, so that's it. We're going to turn it over to chat. Vincent, that's right. Vincent's going to do some cool stuff, someone. Into Reno, yes. Does a unique interrupt. That's right, you guys were saying that before, yeah? Or Rude's unique counters for female characters. Yeah, it's it's so much care put into it. You also have that samurai clash between Sephiroth and Cloud. Yep. Oh, there's so much good stuff. Yeah, I, I had this happen to me where we accidentally both did the Punisher stance, or like counter stance. <laughs> And then they just waited. And then the first one to strike died. It was it was so good. <clears throat> Moving on to dialogue. Listen. <laughs> Listen. Dialogue is no joke in this game. I'm trying to think of my favorite example. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to the Cloud Tifa combos. There's a couple where it's just when you're talking about her dress that she wants to wear, <clears throat> and you and you tell her it's it's so organic. Um I, I say this is different characterization because it's more Heather delivered, but the dialogue is so organic you know it's not crazy and you'll get it in a lot of the small scenes which i love but there's another scene with uh with cloud and barrett in the opening of the game it was in the demo and you're running through the reactor and there's this scene where cloud barrett asks like what are you 20 something and he's like no i'm soldier first class cloud strife first class soldier first class cloud strife soldier for and he's just like what the hell are you talking about i was talking about your age that's your goddamn rank. Like, and the way he says it is so real. Like, you know, it wasn't like, Hey, I'm at your age, not your rank. Come on. Like, no, it's not like anime voice acting. Which, again, I love anime. Don't get me wrong. But what they needed for this is that reality to it. And it's so good that Barrett is just like, Yeah, dude, what Like, what the hell's wrong with you? Like, I'm literally asking your age. Like, has no one ever asked you how old you are? Are you insane? Like, you know what I mean? That's, that's what you would say to somebody right there. And he, he, was, he was being funny, too. Especially with Tifa and Cloud. There's something about that relationship. And to me, I think it's honestly, it's the combo of Cody and Britt. They are so naturalistic in their delivery. When you get those quiet scenes with them, it, just, it hits different. It really does. 
talk with cloud. Uh, Elmira's talk with cloud. That's real, man. You made a trade off right here. Power for a normal life. You know you did. And he's just like, all right. And uh, there's a lot of examples like that. But th this gets more into like a writing territory. It's more related to narrative, of course, which we talked about. But yeah, the writing of the dialogue is where it really shines. And this also comes down to direction, right? Uh, vocal direction uh, for the voice acting. But the dialogue is just so different than even most Final Fantasies. Uh, there's a lot more swearing, as you know. But for me, it's the same with, you know, I joke booby, blood, booze. Like, if it's going to be in there, like the more adult stuff, like it has to serve the story. It can't just be like, you know, Game of Thrones where it's like, just for the sake of it, we're gonna have, we gotta reach our booby quota, we gotta reach our, like, somebody got their arm chopped off. Like, it adds a little bit of juice to it, adds a little bit of sauce to it, which I love. Um, and yet, back to the voices, too, like, we already talked about performance, but, I mean, the reason the performances are so good is only because of the writing and the dialogue. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, the only reason they could reach that top-tier level where, where we're just, like, we're feeling it. It's so intimate. It's so rich, and uh, it's so connected. The characters is because of the dialogue. When when Tifa says like they took everything from us, you feel it, and she doesn't have to say anything. That's the point that comes back to performance with the dialogue connection. She doesn't have to explain what happened. If you're a new player, you say, "Oh God, what happened to them?" Like you feel it, even though you don't see it. It's show don't tell, right? If it was an anime, she might have said like, <laughs> you know. They took everything us from us again, Cloud. Like that time they destroyed our town and they destroyed our parents and then they burned the town and then they stabbed the parents and then they burned the parents too. And then they went to the mocker reactor and then you attacked him and he fell down to the thing. And then... it's like, okay, we get it. Uh, less is more. Show don't tell. Dialogue kills it. And then I love Sephiroth in this game. Speaking of dialogue, his dialogue is lofty. It's, it's this heightened ridic you know uh auspicious way of speaking because this is someone who literally thinks they've become a god um and he essentially has and he speaks in this heightened way this lofty way this higher way of speaking and i love it it works it works for what he's saying you know so i can't wait because keep in mind it's that sephiroth it's like end game sephiroth we believe anyway sounds like the last season of game of thrones yeah <laughs> game of thrones i don't want it i don't want it you are my queen. But there's like, okay, so perfect example is like Johnny. Johnny is like anime humor. I'm coming for you, baby. I'm coming, Tifa. Woo, yeah, the sauce, man. The sauce, man. Like that's anime, fun, big. It's, it's great. But he is a comic relief. It's for a fun, ridiculous, very like Japanese humor part of the game. Hence, Johnny. And just how Tifa says, how Tifa says, like, yeah, I know. It's literally, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. That's the line. That's the dialogue. The way Britt Barron says that, like, tears your soul out. Any of the sort of anime feels in here, they chose to do that. It wasn't like, oh, a slip up. We hired an anime voice actor. Like, no. That's, we, we told, the director said, do that voice. You know, these voice actors are incredibly skilled. They can do whatever you want. They're not like, oh, we can only do anime voice. Sorry. So the, re the, uh, the way they were able to strike a balance for old fans who come from more of like an Advent Children anime voice acting space and comfort zone and then combine that with the, uh, this, this sort of like acting for the camera style, a very realistic, very organic way is genius. That's a 10 for me, baby. Dialogue 10. We're going to turn it over to chat. Oh my God. Marl talking to Cla Yeah, Marl is a standout too. 32% at nine. That's a pretty significant vote. Yeah, like, I'm sure there's a line or two that, like, wasn't absolutely perfect. But again, I can't take five seconds or less, like, three seconds out of 60 hours and say that's a nine, you know? All right, we're moving on, guys, to pacing. So, for me, this game has incredible pacing. Uh, there is, honestly, let me think about, okay, let's, let's think about the chapters. So, chapter one, we have that. Yeah, the opening of this game is fantastic. Chapter one just opens like a freaking blockbuster insane hero's journey begins you know it's just it's it's a it's a mixture of like that narrative novel opening with the pacing of a of a like high budget triple a budget action film it's incredibly done um with great dialogue mixed in there in between the boss fights uh the exit is so good when you meet sephiroth what a great mix up on the pacing right you meet sephiroth in the alley it's just such a genius way to mix it up and throw you off as horror vibes 
really scary. You get the mystery in there. So there's mystery. There's intrigue. That's what I want to know. There's intrigue to the story. And then chapter three, we have this awesome like world building section in the slums. Tifa, we get these beautiful intimate conversations. We get the confrontation with Cloud and Barrett. Uh, chapter four, five, six. We're, oh, the the Jesse thing. What an amazing thing. The Jesse chapter, I love. I think it's chapter four. The Jesse stuff. Enough of it. You go and then you see the upper plate. You see another huge section of the upper plate. We had only seen sector two, or I'm sorry, sector eight before that. Then we go up there, we see the upper plate. We see her dad. We learn about that. Then we have another epic fight with Roche in the motorcycle chase. But then we get the downtime at Jesse's house. Like, we have a stealth section. We have a sad realization of Jesse's backstory. Guys, it is just incredibly paced. Um, what there? We, then we have the crazy section with the whispers and then the Airbuster fight. Don't even get me started in the Airbus. It's so epic. It's so cinematic. Um, the sneaking. I will say though, um, only because I think I was reading chat and stuff, the pacing for the the maze section was a little. It was a little long for me. It was a little bit like the Undercity Suns, which was awesome. I just I felt very self conscious. I think only because I was streaming, like trying to go through the. Uh, I got lost. You guys were there. I got lost for like hours in that place because I was trying to get all the materia so I was like crap I gotta get materia because you know stream but yeah an airbuster was perfect the sewers were a similar thing I got confused for a while in that one part only because I couldn't find the switch but then once I was like oh I just have to look for a switch I found it right away so I can't really call it bad pacing but for me it slowed down a little bit but the story was so good and it was such a nice intimate experience with Cloud Tifa and Aerith so I think it's great. And then the ending, a finale, can we even, like, ugh, what is there even to say about it besides the pacing is ramping up and being incredible? I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. Uh, there's so much to say about it. But from when you hit Shinra Tower and you fight, uh, like, it, it's it, Shinra Tower is like its own experience, right? Because you have the, the section where you're Tifa. And you jump across the things, and then you go into the stairs, the elevator, it's a choice, which is funny or, or wacky, depending on which one you choose. And then you have the whole cutscenes with Scarlet and the other guys in the meeting, and then you have Hojo being creepy, and then you have the trail of blood, and you have the drum. It's just, it's like a pacing masterclass, man. There's so much there. It's great, but as far as the narrative pacing, <coughs> amazing, amazing. The Undercity Suns and the Sewers, I would have loved to see, it felt very like FF13 but putting like a very simple puzzle into it. This happened a couple times in FF13. I think you were like snow and you had to like arrange stairs. I remember doing that. The, what would have made it perfect for me. It wouldn't have even changed the layout of it. It's just give me some meaningful puzzles. I think that would have been fantastic. So that's really the only thing I could add there. And when I say meaningful puzzles, I mean like enjoyable, fun, you know, like think Legend of Zelda, uh, or think even if you don't want to go the Zelda route where it's like interactive and you need like gadgets and stuff You could go like a Resident Evil sort of puzzles or like I guess Resident Evil 1 uh, Sort of puzzle where it's like, okay. Here's like a cool piece that you have to like, you know Figure out a riddle and figure out where to put the pieces in order like, you know, something like that Would have just given it a little more juice to it a little bit more motivation perhaps but um that's more level. Yeah, it could even be level design, but I'm, I'm mentioning it in pacing just because of the um, just because of the time it took. If that makes sense, like it definitely slowed down my experience because it slowed down like my uh, urgency. If that makes sense, yeah, I will give pacing a nine, just because that was it was definitely a sticking point for me. Honestly, it's probably only because I was streaming. Like it, it's a totally different experience when you stream a game versus playing it alone. Narrative pacing, I'm fine with the sewers, even with the gameplay senses. Yeah, see, that, that's the thing. Narrative pacing is perfect, right? When you look at it from a narrative aspect, but the problem is, was my personal gameplay experience pretty much because I was streaming, but that was my experience, right? So I have to be fair, but it's interesting to see that pacing is pretty much the only issue we've had so far, besides like nines and eights from a couple of people. Near perfect, says ID buddy, only complaints I give her Undercity Suns. Yeah, it seems like Undercity Suns uh, was a sticking point for some of us. We're moving on to adaptations. This, this is a rare category that's pretty much only going to apply to this game, right? So, <laughs> um, this won't work for newer games unless it's like a remake, right? But for me, adaptation is, is expertly done. Um, we talked about it before, but I said this a million times. No one has ever seen FF7. 
They've only seen this sort of top-down view, no performance, no facial performance, no facial movement, no acting whatsoever to be seen, no voice either, just text. It's pretty much like reading a novel, uh, but or going to the theater, but without acting. If everybody, if it was a puppet show in a theater, but without sound, with like dialogue boxes, that's what FF7 is. So it's a limited but awesome experience. Um, so this is why the adaptation is, is so important. And I mean, they nailed it so hard, guys. Look at the opening bombing mission. Compare the openings to these games. The fact that they keep it so loyal, but expand on it. Mind blowing. A paper puppet show. Good way to say, yeah. Good way to say. What's up, Crimson? Yep, we're reviewing the game. The remake, yeah. Uh, a paper puppet show is a great way to describe it. But yeah, it's this, the way they translate, for example, Okay, we go down to the slums, and then we uh, speak to Tifa and Barrett, and then we're on the next mission. The fact that they were able to take it and bring the slums to life, and not make it boring, and have like awesome scenes with Tifa and Barrett, meaningful connections with the NPCs in the slums, insanely deep uh, world building with all the NPCs in the slums, and building out Tifa and Cloud's relationship so beautifully, um, None of this is in there. I can say because we are playing the original game, the OG, right now on Twitch. We just took a night off to do this review. Um, it's so gloriously done. Honestly. So, I have to say that the adaptation is like perfect. Like, look at Game of Thrones, which is a horrible, god-awful adaptation. Season 1 of Game of Thrones is a fantastic adaptation. And then it just tanks. It gets worse and worse every single season. Until the final season of Game of Thrones doesn't even feel like the same story. I mean, there is nothing to adapt, to be fair. But this is an example of a fantastic adaptation. Taking a form of media, in this case, which is dated, um, having the same artists come back to it. And there's a difference between this and Game of Thrones. It's the same artists. Come back to it and just pour their love into it, man, and expand upon it. And with the greater technology, there's a misconstrued version and like a weird version of all these characters from like... Kingdom Hearts and stuff because they're very like one-dimensional like weird versions of the Kingdom Hearts and then all the weird fan art over the years because it didn't exist these characters didn't exist as like photo real so there's all these weird adaptations of them and then we finally get them and it's it feels so right do you know what I mean and it brings them back yeah exactly emo cloud and Saint Aerith that's the perfect way to put it two horrible one-dimensional just like butchering of those characters awesome and yeah it's just it's great the couple nines i'd be curious what uh, a couple people didn't like i would assume it has to do with the stuff that was added but the thing about the added stuff at the end is that's not adaptation that's uh giving us extra cherry on top so like i always jokingly say like the level of entitlement to say that i know i know cloud better and i know tifa better than than nojima it's like and and no more it's like, wait the guy who created them and wrote the script for the original. What do you say? I know more. It's my story. My characters. Cloud wouldn't say that. Tifa wouldn't do that. It's, like, oh, it's so cringe. It's so cringe. We're going to talk about lighting and atmosphere. And again, this is... I won't spend too much time on it because I recommend watching my uh, breakdown. Watch my breakdown of the, uh, the ending scene. Shot for shot. I get a lot more into the science of filmmaking. But we talked about it earlier. There's a full lighting team for this game, guys. And you can really see it. You can really feel it. The fact that they went this deep into it uh, with the lighting, where the fact that there's... We talked about it in my demo review, actually. They are constantly lighting the characters' faces in creative ways. Uh, in ways that you would not see in gaming ever, mostly. Uh, they'll put these like floor lights angled up at the characters' faces, so when they speak, it's a naturalistic lighting, so you get that little tint in the eye classic like lighting for scenes and movies they actually have key lights and rim lights that appear only for the cutscenes. this is the lighting team's work i remember with leslie when i caught one i was like wait there's a ring light on his right shoulder and then it just fades away when the cutscene's over it's like wait a second they actually put in an extra light source just for the cutscene when you see his face so his eyes are well lit and then they took it off expertly done filmic level there's a lighting team i feel like most games don't have that and you, you can you can tell you can tell um and besides the lighting of course it plays into the atmosphere that's why i included it here the atmosphere look what we see right now mako reactor second mission has a blue tint to it 
So it's a totally different feel, more cool, a more relaxing feel. And it has this fun mini game approach. You're going through, it's a very soothing color, blue. So you're going through and you're, you're deconstructing the Airbuster piece by piece. It's, it's enjoyable, it's kind of chilled out. It's different. The opening bombing mission, however, has this foreboding reds and, and the Mako color behind me, the cyans and the reds, which brings about this, this feeling of like intensity and the red and passion and action. And uh, it's just a totally different feeling. And of course, they add to this by the music choice. It's all incredibly done. Uh, the atmosphere of the ending, of the edge of creation, it's just, it's palpable. You can feel it. Shinra Tower. Oh my god, the lighting in Shinra Tower is so dark. It's so, uh, it's so artificial. It's so uneasy. Not ever get this level of detail. Because you don't need to. It's easy to just be like, yeah, whatever. Increase the exposure on the camera. If it's dark. With these new games, you can like do whatever they want with the camera. It's not like that in real life. That's why it doesn't feel like a movie, though. It doesn't have that connectedness to what we're used to recognizing because lighting is so essential in film. So yeah, the atmosphere uh, is palpable in some places, man. The, the slums, you can feel it. There's a color There's a color theory. Watch my other videos if you want to see me get deeper into it. But easy, easy 10. It, it's, if someone was to rate this and not like uh, a lower score, I would, just, I would need to hear their like, professional reason for it. Because for me, it's, it's just perfect. There's no... There's no reason. Lighting team needs an award for their achievements. I'd have to agree. Fantastic. And again, like if you have a reason, it better be, it better be uh, good. <laughs> but yeah, I go pretty deep into it. Actually, pretty deep in my demo reaction of all things, because it was the first time we got to see the game in action. One hundred percent perfect score. Damn. I think that's the only category. Makes sense to me. It checks out. Oh my god. Yeah, we didn't even talk about the honey bee. And, oh, that's a whole different thing. Lighting is ridiculous. This is a. All right, so we're on to gameplay. <laughs> what an appropriate thing to have on in the background for gameplay. So this game's gameplay, I said it a million times, I talked about it at length in my other videos, but it's the combination, it's the culmination of every Final Fantasy's best battle systems. But really, every single one. Uh, you have the ATB, which is perfected from Final Fantasy 1 through 9, um, from the turn-based originals to 1 through 9. We have the beautiful strategy from Final Fantasy 10 and the menuing, and that glorious, you know, stopping the battle and slowing it down to make your choices. Final Fantasy 11 and 12, which give us that MMO feel of movement and combat implemented. Final Fantasy 13, the stagger system, that cinematic quality, all in there, boom, implemented. Stagger system, so enjoyable, so fun, made even better in this game. Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy 14, again, perfecting the movement and combat. Final Fantasy 15, that Kingdom Hearts flair, man, that, that juice, that movement, that rush of fighting, the cinematic feel to it, uh, jumping around, the character switching. Final Fantasy 15 and the final version has character switching. And then finally, FF7 Remake comes in. It's all in there. It's perfected to a science. It combines the best of every Final Fantasy. And it's been so enjoyable. And then don't even get me started on how hard mode, going back and playing the game on hard mode made me appreciate the battle system so much more. It's so cerebral. It's so beautiful. The way you can do character switching is so satisfying because it's, it's Dark Souls level action and dodging and defending and timing. Uh, using your fight IQ to figure out the situations and learning boss patterns and enemy attacks. But it has the FF10 level of menuing and it's all in there and it's so beautifully done. So, I mean, it's, it's just perfect. It's just perfect. Again, I could talk about some of the sections that are just like, it's more like a design thing, I guess, level design. But for me, I mean, the gameplay is just out of control, man. It's so fun. Like I haven't played a game that's this, this fun. In so long. 15 is great, but it doesn't have that weight to it. It doesn't have that sort of like, you know what I mean? Like when Cloud swings his sword, you feel it. FF15 has it in some cases, like Warp Strike, so satisfying and stuff like that. But a lot of it was just kind of, uh, FF12 is the ultimate example of like weightlessness. Doesn't have that feeling of, <laughs> they just kind of like bonk people like, boom. Like, you know, you don't have that. Uh, I don't think the enemies even react in that game, unless I'm misremembering. But man, this game, it perfects everything. It feels, and this is the thing, it feels like Final Fantasy. It actually does. 15 is, yeah, 15 is floaty, putty, exactly. Not bad, but just floaty. It feels like Kingdom Hearts, which is also very floaty. This game is grounded, man. You smack people and you feel it. The sound design, everything comes together in the gameplay. Um, even just the movement is so satisfying. Running around the slums in the gameplay. Uh, Shinra Tower, traversing it, traversing the world is very satisfying. Uh, the battle system is so good. The movement's great. The camera, I think, is fantastic. One of the best cameras in any game I've ever played. I saw some people complaining about it, which did surprise me. But for me, perfect. 
Cherith, exactly. <laughs> Cherith. Hard mode gave me an appreciation. Yeah. Hard mode made me realize how amazing this is. You take away items, you take away a get out of jail free pass, the gameplay just pops off to be even more enjoyable. So for me, I think I can't even possibly not do this. It's a 10. It is. Like there's a couple things, again, I could talk about. It's more design. Um, with that one particular level, I would have liked maybe maybe a puzzle, maybe just a more difficult, uh, fresh way to go about it. But again, it's it's so minor, man. I was watching, I was reading chat, I was on stream. It's, just, it's so minor. I cannot knock a whole point off for it. Like this game is one of my favorite games ever made. It's just so good. The good is so good. The bad is like one percent bad. <laughs> it's so small. Shoot. Oh wow, nine is actually winning right now for gameplay, all right? Oh wow, it tied, look at that. 10 for nine, 10 for 10, that's awesome. First tie we've had. All right, so we're gonna talk about creativity. Creativity, I mean, come on guys. Look at how they go about the Honey Bee Inn. This goes more into adaptation, this goes into performance, so we're kinda, we're kinda combining as we get to the end here. But the creativity of the Honey Bee Inn section, it's so well realized, it's so beautifully done. The fact that they had like, Japanese choreographers do that dance and then the way it's shot is so expertly done. Let's not even talk about the lighting in that scene. It's literally lit as you would light like a, a fully engaged stage performance. Most games would not do that. It would just be like, yeah, whatever, there's a stage or some lights. Like they went big brain, galaxy brain, insane performance, insane creativity. They took, and again, this is more adaptation, but it's, it's very connected. There's a connect in this here. They took a scene which could have easily just been, oh yeah, like make it look pretty, whatever, give Cloud a cool dress, like, and they turned it into this whole experience. The Honey Bee Inn is, is a, it's a production. Uh, it's so big, it's so grand, it's so majestic, and they didn't have to do all that. They really didn't. So that, that's that's the easiest way to describe it, is Honey Bee. Um, but look at even, just, look at this Airbuster fight that's on, man. Using the environment to their advantage, and this again relates to gameplay. Uh, was so enjoyable to me, like making the bosses cinematic in a creative way. Uh, Airbuster can die in what is it, like two or three hits with Limit Break or something like that? In the original, I just played it the other day. I was like, oh, that was like a one and a half minute battle. What the heck? Um, this is just, they've taken it, they've turned it into this beautiful cinematic experience. It's a 10 for me. I can't think of anything where I'm like, um, yeah, garbage. They turn minor fights into huge spectacle. That, that's, that's the word right there. Harry just nailed it. Spectacle. This game is full of spectacle nonstop. And it's glorious. You can sum up the creativity, uh, how they turn the legacy wall market. Yeah, like we said, I started with wall market, right? We talk about uh, Honey Bee Inn. That's the best way I can talk about creativity. And we have, yep, 10 with 56%. Five votes for nine, three votes for eight. Sounds about right, man. Yeah. All right, so for design, listen. Um, if we're talking about like more of a film level of design, perfect score. Absolutely perfect score. I mean, look at the level. I have the art book here too. Look at the level of detail that went into this and the level of care that they took, even with just the main character designs, Cloud, Tifa, Barrett, uh, Aerith, taking these guys up to a mod or more modern look at their outfits, um, but keeping them so faithful. It's Nomura and Roberto Ferrari working together on this. My God, set design. <laughs> set design is incredible in this game. We talked about it. It plays into lighting. It plays into uh, atmosphere. Uh, it plays into world building. But man, the set design is out of this world. Tifa never addressing Sephiroth. I don't I don't see any problem with that either. I'm with BGG on that one. Yeah, Tifa is not one to, uh, to come out and express herself so readily. That's That's pretty much the mainstay of Tifa's character. And she's absolutely not one to undermine Cloud in his uh, in his big moments. When you get to a level of iconic characters, man, and you're gonna take said iconic character and update it because of lack of technology. Honestly, a great way to look at this is look at Darth Vader, okay? Darth Vader, believe it or not, has been updated many times in his design. You just don't know it unless you're really paying attention and you're into that sort of thing and you're super into Star Wars. But there's a lot of subtle changes between episode four Darth Vader, episode five, episode six, and then when he comes back in Revenge of the Sith, it's like this ultimate form of him. These little tweaks in design, like, hey, let's like shorten this part of his mask just a little bit, kind of emphasize his shoulders, make it more imposing. 
and all these other things. If you look at episode four, Helmet of Darth Vader, it's like massive. It's much bigger. The neck is like really out to here and stuff. But then as he gets more imposing, his neck becomes thinner, the jawline's more pronounced, the shoulders are there and everything. So this is to the point when you're looking at world-class character design, is they're taking an iconic thing, but they can't change it. You can't change it so much so you don't recognize the character anymore. Um, and that's what they did. It's, it's the Darth Vader update, what they did to uh, Cloud. Look at Reno, man. You know, those little updates, like, like popping the shirt open a little bit on Reno, it does so much for his character because it's so Reno, right? And like a modern design, him, it's such a thing. He has like that kind of like, like, you know, devil may care thing going on. So it works. It's also like a little bit runway, which is cool because he's like super fashionable, which makes sense. He dyed his hair red. He's obviously into fashion. Yes, he dyed his hair red. Look at the roots of his hair. Clearly like a different color, you know? So yeah, it's cool. Like I love these little aspects that um, you'll notice on all of them. Rude. What is Rude known for? Being so ridiculously uh, clean and pristine. He's the Ignis of this world, right? So with Rude, you have, he's got the sunglasses and have my children. He pulls them back out, puts them back on. But in this, they, they took it a step further to his suit, man. It's his untouched, perfect suit. Perfect fit suit. Like, look at Reno. He's got the loose, open shirt. Um, he, he's got his untucked shirt. You know, he's kind of like, he's kind of, uh, what's the word? Relaxed, kind of casual, rude. Everything is like, like he even says, gotta dot my T's, cross my I's, man. That's just who he is. God, this is tough. Like, I want to give it a nine, but it's, it's such an asinine choice. Because look at the design of the characters and the world building and everything. It's, it's a, it feels really asinine to give it a nine. I don't know if I can justify it. I really, because of who I am as an artist, like I cannot justify it. Looking at the Roberto Ferrari drawings and the Namora drawings and everything. And the set design, it's, it's kind of like I said before, it's too, the good is too good. Ten. And like I said, we already knocked pacing on nine. So I can't justify like carrying that through multiple, uh, categories where you have Tifa's iconography is like this martial arts outfit slash like bartending mix but then they take it to make sense in a modern era um, as a martial artist how would you dress like I said a lot of my friends who are in the fitness industry um, they don't dress that dissimilar from that considering this is a fantasy game where a dude's carrying around like a hundred pound sword on his back the fact that it's that close to like real sportswear a real martial arts sportswear is just like incredible um, fashionable martial arts, functional gear. Actually, what a, what a great scene to have right now for visuals. So a lot of people, of course, have noticed or commented on this texture bug. The issue is, as as graciously uh, BGG actually pointed out to us on stream, it was, uh, it was a few streams ago, he actually sent me the link. Turns out that all these textures are perfect. They're there. <laughs> and they're not, uh, they're not, uh, you know, like N64 textures that they just like, oops, we don't know how to make good textures in 2020. Like it's Square Enix, dude. They're all about quality. Of course they made them. Turns out it's an Unreal Engine issue. Uh, makes sense. This is only, uh, besides Kingdom Hearts 3, I think this is their only other Unreal game. So is that the game I played? Yes. Are they fixing it? ASAP? Yes. They did not design it like that also. So I really can't, uh, I really can't knock it on that. Like, I don't, I don't think it's right. Um, there's an interesting phenomenon, which we talked about something uh, earlier tonight when we were on, uh, I think it was performance actually. And it was the, uh, the character models looking, uh, well, they're differently rendered. Well, they're not rendered in the current thing we're looking at. And then they are rendered in the, uh, the cutscenes at the end of the game and other parts of like the VR room. And people had commented, there's a discrepancy there because when their hair is rendered, for example, it's a perfect triangle, right? And then when you look at uh, the pre-rendered cutscenes, or the unrendered cutscenes here, they put like filters on the hair to make it look soft and bushy and flowy, like actual hair. But in fact, it is anime hair, as it was drawn by Nomura and Roberto Ferrari, and it is not soft and bushy like that. It is actually like a bunch of triangles. So it's a weird discrepancy that some people had. I don't think it attracts anything because here's the thing. A lot of people are like, oh, it looks it looks slightly different. It looks slightly different in, in the in the CG cutscenes compared to the uh, the in game stuff. It's like, oh, really? Like uh, the original FF7? You're going to tell me it's it's worse than that <laughs> or FF8 or 9 or 10? Like 
ridiculously much, much bigger discrepancies in, uh, you know, 7 through 10. And 12, it looks like a totally different medium, a totally different thing. So the fact that, you know, the hair looks slightly different, um, the faces have that little bit more Advent Children look to them, a little more, like, kind of clean, perfect faces, you know? I wouldn't say, uh, I wouldn't say it's bad at all, man. It's just a, it's two different studios working on it as well. It's Midgar. It's the full Midgar. Look at the opening scene. We get to see every aspect of the city and how it works, how it functions. Um, we get to see all the characters alive and, and the motion capture for the faces is a new thing for Square Enix. So cool to see that fully realized. Mocap for the bodies, the, the, the design category. We just went over it. The, the costumes. It's all incredible. I'm trying to be as fair as I can with this, guys. People play through this entire game. This ridiculous game that has so much insane work put into the design and the characters and everything in between. And literally a couple textures didn't load properly. And that's what they remember about the visuals. Like you watch that VR scene in Shinra headquarters where it shows you the ancients and like Sephiroth and all this crazy stuff. And you have no comment on that. You don't have a damn thing to say about that, as if it didn't even happen. It's, oh yeah, but like, they just one part of the game where like, it was kind of fuzzy. Somebody after the demo, like, went in and got the files, I don't know what the hell they do, and they found like a mesh of Noctis's head, and then they over, they found a mesh of Cloud's head, and they like, overlaid the two meshes of Cloud and Noctis's head over one another. And this person tried to do like, a cancel tweet uh, on Square Enix. And they were like, oh my god. They were like all caps, like, oh, I, I found them out. I found them out. I outed Square Enix. Like, it's so similar to Noctis's head. I could have changed this in five minutes. It's Noctis's head with minor tweaks. He literally is Noctis. This is disgusting. I, I hate Square Enix. No work was put into this. Ah! And everybody was just like, wait, this, what? <laughs> is this a joke? <laughs> like, God forbid that, wow, an artist who uh, has, has, has designs characters in a similar style, has similar heads, similar skull structure and stuff. It was the dumbest thing I've ever, yeah. And they, oh, they use previous resources. Insane. Yeah. It, it's like, it's like we've said 50 times as a joke now, but like, it's as if people are saying, did you guys know that like Van Gogh, one of the greatest artists in existence, like, like I could tell that was a Van Gogh painting <laughs> before you told me. Horrible artist is like no. That's that's actually why he's one of the greatest artists ever to live in human history. Is because you know his style so well. <laughs> like what he's saying, a similar style by an artist was an established style. Yeah, we said this joke fifty times now, but it 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 uh it bears repeating. Insane. <laughs> it's almost like something literally everyone does. Yeah, but that one, dude. The comments were hilarious because this person thought they were like. Finally, I brought down Square Enix, my ultimate enemy. They've been had, and everybody's just like, wait, why would anyone ever care about this? Like, you must be joking. Like, what are you talking about? More like reference, yeah. People didn't realize sometimes the artists cheat when creating art. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it cheating. I mean, that's like saying when I took nude, uh, nude figure uh, drawing class that I was cheating because there was a nude person in front of me and I was drawing them. Cheating. Yeah, huge misconception in the outside of professional art communities that like using references is wrong. Nothing evolves from a vacuum, man. All right, guys, final category. Here we go. Replay value, replayability. For me, this game has already proven itself to have insanely high replay value because I replayed it already. <laughs> I replayed it the second I beat it on hard mode. And like we said earlier for gameplay, I can't believe how hard mode taught me. It, it tutored me in how fantastic uh, this game is. Like, even more than I already thought it was. It made me realize how genius the design... This is, again, why I couldn't um, why I couldn't knock it for design. The battle system is so greatly designed that it's that point of taking away items. You realize items were almost just like a get-out-of-jail-free pass. And you realize just how brilliant this battle system is. Um where you can go into it and if you die to a battle it's not just like get good you suck yeah have better reaction time because you're too slow or something like that it's you didn't have a sound enough strategy get back in there go into your materia 
go into your character, what, what three characters are you bringing, what strategy are you doing. If you don't have a strategy, you will die. Absolutely every time. You need to have a strategy, but when you do, it rewards you for it. It just gifts you this glorious victory. And um, it's different. I'll say it's different from like Dark Souls. And we all know that Dark Souls feeling when you finally beat a boss on Dark Souls, you learn his attack patterns, you get them. It's different because it's reaction time. It feels like you're in a real fight or something. Like you're dodging, and, you know, you're striking and stuff. But in this, it has that other aspect of being cerebral. And it's the same reason it actually exhausts me, this game. Like my brain, if I if I was dying to like a boss for two or three hours straight, I, I just, I was like dead inside. Um, it's so cerebral, which I think is a good thing. Because like I said, it, it has combined every Final Fantasy battle system perfectly into one. And what that does for replay value is it gives it another layer of depth that you're able to go back in and not just be like, oh yeah, I already memorized this boss's like movements, so I just win easy like you can do it 20 different ways because even on hell house i did it my own janky way just to like prove i could um horrible strategies but the fact is i did have a strategy even though it was like misinformed and like incomplete and the fact that i could do that and then i'd always be like all right we finally beat it on hard what did you guys do i'm curious and you guys would say stuff that is just so different to mine but also effective in its own way or more effective. And then Jedge actually, there's Jedge in chat right now, went along and shared with me this, and I gotta show it to BGG if he hasn't seen it. These uh, these no damage runs of some of the bosses in this game, no damage taken, no damage. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. You don't even control the other characters. What do you mean no damage? No damage on them too? He's like, yeah, no damage taken. And like, that's the level you can take on this game. Like that speed run level perfection. You know, exploiting every single strategy. I mean, exploiting is the wrong word there. I'm talking about speedruns, but it's not like a glitch. Like, he's just using the battle system. So, yeah. Um, having already replayed the game, I can tell you there's an incredibly high replay value. And um, I'm going to go back in, man. I realized, tragically, in our last day of playing this game, I believe, that uh, playing it with subtitles is a horrible tragedy. I, that's an easy 10 for me. So, good stuff, guys. That is the end of the categories. We'll do a quick closing thought it's just it's a dream come true to, to have this it's it's really surreal actually to have this and uh let's add up our score here so my final score <laughs> rock fantasy 7 remake is 9.9411764 a very specific number whoever scored a 9.9411764 uh or 763 i'd be really upset to hear about that because that's really egregious, taking away that many points, in my opinion. The people who have even like pretty, pretty glaring issues on a couple parts of the game are still like, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's FF7 remake, like the memories, man, the characters, you know? <laughs> it's so good. And like, like I said before, the the lows, I, like I even had like, even with music and stuff, I had a couple gripes with a couple times and some of the other uh, things, but it's, just, it's such a minor, like, oh, by the way, there's one thought I had like, for two seconds in my 60 hour experience you know it's so minor i can't even knock it off from a 10. Really, it's just a privilege to be able to play this game to revisit these characters in this environment if you had told me this was going to happen and you know when did advent children come out we said 2004 2005 something like that if you had told me this was this was going to be a thing i would have thought you were a lunatic back then you know with this level of fidelity oh, by the way it'll have better graphics than advent children stop like, go away. What are you talking about? Better graphics than Adventure. It's not possible. You know, so it's just crazy, man. The, again, the, when when I was in the church is when it hit me. Like I said, every time when I was there, it's like the fact that I'm in Advent Children, I can move the camera and walk around. It's just like you feel like a kid again. There's something about that. And then, you know, beyond that, just it's Final Fantasy VII, <laughs> like which came out when I was in third grade or something like that. So, yeah, the fact that we can go back to those... Uh, to those roots, to the nostalgia, but be rewarded with this just explosion of artistic integrity and, and passion. And they're just pouring their love into everything. It's so crazy to me. And it says everything. It says everything about the artists, like I always say, right? Uh, the fact that they're willing to put this much of themselves into it when it's a 23 year old project, um, they're even more enthusiastic to, to get in there. Like the creators came out and actually said, again, this works for my Nomura video. <laughs> My Nomura defense, but the creators came out and said, yeah, actually, we wanted to change a lot of stuff, but Nomura kept harping, no, 
we are gonna keep all the iconic scenes because the fans deserve that. How much you wanna bet Nomura is happy to do a game without Big Papa Disney breathing down his neck? Oh, I, I would bet all the gill you can imagine, man. It's alive. They've taken a project which is so done, FF7, and it's, it's alive. Again, Circle, it's better than ever. I can't wait for part two. Max Dude feels the exact same way about how people are talking about it. Oh, that people are excited about it? Yeah, no, it's it's alive, man. That's the best thing I can say. It's alive, it's a great time to be a Final Fantasy fan. Okay, that is my review. If you're watching on YouTube, please make sure to subscribe if you want to see more cinematic language analysis and you want to hop into it, let me know in the comments or in the chat here on Twitch what you want to see next. We're going to talk about more games. We're going to continue this fun journey and just keep loving life. Four hour review, why not? And uh, thank you guys for reviewing it with me. This is so much fun to include you. I'm I'm excited. We're gonna make a couple tweaks to this uh, going forward for other games. I shall leave you. Oh my God, Koopa-san. Gungaga. <laughs> me? Gungaga. Thank you, Koopa-san, for the 424. <laughs>